introduce myself. I'm Gerald Wilson, Director of Entrepreneurship here at Enterprise Works. We're pleased to have uh, Professor Melissa Grigner joining us uh, for part two on managing uh, a, a startup team. Um, I think I know from personal experience that the relationship between a founder and um, and their investors, who oftentimes become part of the board of directors, is a complex one and it's a challenging one to navigate. And unfortunately, many times as founders, um, we have very little preparation for how to engage with, with these investors who end up playing an important governor's role in our, in our companies. So, uh, Professor Gregner was kind enough to speak to us uh, last week about um, you know, the founding team, which generally will include the founders, their employees, advisors, and the board of directors. But I think this particular part of the team, the board of directors, uh, demands uh, more time uh, in a discussion. So I'm pleased to have Professor Gregner joining us again to lead us in this discussion. Um, there's a lot of research in this area which you will talk about. Um, we will have uh, another uh, fireside chat with Chris Harbert on April 30th. Um, Chris has a background of having been a founder of a number of companies in our ecosystem as well as be a, a member of the board of directors. And so we'll be taking a lot of what we've learned uh, last week and this week into a fireside chat with someone who has played uh, both of those roles, the founder bringing on board a new board of directors and has been added to the board of directors of other companies. So with that, please join me in, in uh, giving Professor Gregner a warm Enterprise Works welcome. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I want to go to that fireside chat. That sounds super cool. Um, so as Gerald mentioned, last week um, I talked about the team, focusing on the, the founding team. But um, we talked a little bit about the fact that for a startup, your team really includes some outsiders as well. So the board is more closely involved with managing a startup. Uh, and they usually meet more frequently than in a public company. So they're an important part of the team too. And as Gerald also mentioned, it's a very tricky relationship. And it's something that most founders um, go into without a lot to compare it to. So your first board in particular is a little bit unlike any other experience um, you will have had. Even if you have you know, had work experience in a hierarchy, the board is its own special um, kind of animal and deserves some special attention accordingly. So uh, why do boards of directors matter? Let me ask first, do any of you have a board formed yet? You either are entrepreneurs. Yes? And how big is your board and who's on it? Three people? Are you on it? Yeah. And are the other two investors or? One another co-founder and the other is the investor. So you can try to keep it small. Yes, yes. And that is a good idea. So we'll, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So um, a lot of founders think, as long as I still own the majority of the venture, I control it. Um, or at least if none of the investors has a controlling share. But the fact is that that is not equally true. And the reason is that in their investment agreements, um, professional investors in particular usually have stipulations that for certain kinds of big financial and strategic decisions, regardless of the fraction of ownership, they get to independently approve those actions. So these are things like taking on debt, taking in new investors, um, selling the firm, uh, going public, which, you know, of course would be great news for everyone. Making a significant change to the strategy or increasing the option pool. So these are all decisions that are really important to you as a founding team that you have to get approval um, from, uh, from the board. In some cases, uh, if the board is not happy with the CEO, the board can actually replace the CEO. That's actually one of their um, prerogatives that you need to be aware of as a founder. 
But on the other hand, the board can also enable success. So they can offer you advice and expertise, they can make introductions um, and, and help you develop your network. So it's a two-sided kind of relationship. We have this combination of collaboration where they're giving you advice and resources and introductions, um, but on the flip side, they're also monitoring you. And so there's a power dynamic because the board does have the ability to um, change the compensation of the CEO or replace the CEO. So when we're talking about a board for a startup, it usually looks pretty different than a public company where boards tend to be pretty large and there are um, people on the board that don't necessarily have significant ownership in the firm. In a typical early stage board, it will be very small. You might have something like two internal board members, which would be the CEO and perhaps the co-founder, um, two investors, and then one independent that is um, by mutual agreement of the founders and the investors. So I'm going to share with you um, first the results of a really interesting study. And I'll preface this by saying board interactions are really, really hard to study because you want to be in the room observing the board dynamics, and most people won't agree to that. So this is um, the only study I know of where the researcher actually got access to sit in on board meetings, uh, as well as also interviewing board members and founders. Um, so I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes, um, and then I'm actually going to show you a video, um, which is the only video that I've ever seen that's actually inside a startup board meeting. So you can kind of compare what the, the research is saying to what you see in this video, and then we'll, we'll debrief that a bit. So um, this study involved four case studies of venture capital founded startups, and they had these interviews and direct observations. And the goal is to understand what kind of board management leads to more effective strategy development. So what did founders do that led them to um, really have the best, most effective relationship with the board and actually use them to build an effective strategy? And so they found that there were four different behaviors, uh, and then they, they should be done in a certain order. So the first is to treat the board as a set of individuals. When you think of the board, you might think of it as a group, and certainly when the board meets, it's the CEO meeting with the group. But it turns out that the more effective CEOs developed one-on-one -on -one relationships with each board member outside of those board meetings. And they were able to tailor those relationships to what each board member was interested in and cared about. So there's a couple of quotes that illustrate this. So this is a board member saying, I feel like I'm always having the right level of discussion with Andy, which is a pseudonym for the, the CEO, as opposed to getting into the minutia or speaking with too little frequency. So the CEO had figured out what is the level of frequency that works for this board member, what is the level of detail that he or she wants. Um, and then the CEO was explaining his or her perspective on this relationship. It's more me leveraging the director than me going to him and saying, hey, I just wanted to give you an update and hear what you have to say. So he's being very kind of strategic in leveraging that individual relationship rather than just throwing information and having a, um, a conversation with no real goal. The less effective CEOs really just thought of their board as a group, and they didn't develop these individual relationships. They interacted with them almost exclusively in group settings. Um, and even in a public company board, I used to work in management consulting, and one of the key lessons is you never want to go into that senior management meeting presenting something from the first time. You should have already vetted that with each individual top management team member or board member and know that they have bought into it before you, you meet. And so that turns out to be true for these startup boards as well. So the second thing they found was that in these board meetings, the effective CEOs focused the discussion on a single formal alternative. So they didn't go in and say, well, we have this problem, but we have no idea what to do, or even 
here's three different paths you can go down. They chose the best one and presented it to the board as a thumbs up, thumbs down. So one of the CEOs described this and, and said, I don't go present trade-offs with multiple alternatives to them. I say, I believe we have to run this way. Are you with me? The less effective CEOs either proposed multiple alternatives or no alternatives at all. So one of the CEOs described how they thought about this. Well, the board is a problem-solving group on things that are all fuzzy and uncertain. And you can kind of sympathize with that perspective that, well, the board should be helping me with my hardest, most ambiguous problems. But unfortunately, that is not the way that you get the most out of your board. And so the director described this. Well, it was a typical board meeting. It ended up being kind of a discussion you might have over dinner about the state of the world with opinions being thrown back and forth all over the place. And so this kind of meeting is viewed by the directors as lack of focus, um, lack of conviction, and lack of leadership by the CEO. So it tends not to, to go well. So if you are bringing the one formal alternative to the board, you want to be sure that you've at least fully thought that through and gotten some input and ideas beforehand. So what the effective CEOs did is they engaged in brainstorming with the board members, but before or after the formal board meeting. So they didn't do it in the board meeting. So one effective CEO said, my board meetings are really more about updates, you know, the health of the company, letting them see what's going on. In some cases, we get inputs on specific areas of strategy. But, you know, I think it is not the kind of meeting where we expect a debate or discussion. So that's really interesting. Um, and the director said it was a very productive meeting. The objective of the meeting was to figure out as a group what is going on. Um, it was an open discussion and much more free-flowing than the regular structure we have in our board meetings. So what they had done was actually to have a separate brainstorming meeting that wasn't part of the official um, board of directors schedule. So it was not really a board meeting. It was a discussion with directors. So Andy was very open and he just threw out some slides and said, okay guys, this is it, let's discuss. So there's the separation of the really open-ended brainstorming interactions versus the more formal board meetings where you have more of a buttoned up discussion. And the less effective CEOs mix these two things. So they would have these very unfocused, rambling discussions in the formal board meetings. So this director, described it as, we always have this free flow brainstorming format in board meetings and there are points being made. However, they never really all come together. So this is wasted time for everybody. It's not really productive for the CEO. And again, it's kind of undermining their authority as showing that they can guide the discussion and lead it somewhere. I have a question. Yeah. On that previous slide, um, I don't really understand the difference between the second example and the third example. So the difference is, um, and I, I can see why that would be confusing because I didn't give you the full context, but so boards um, typically have a schedule of meetings, which might be like once a month, once a quarter, and there's a typical format to it of here's our financial update, you know, here's what's happening with our customer funnel, et cetera. Um, and there's a certain formality to it. And so what, in the second example, what the CEO did was after one of those board meetings said, well, it seems like there's something that we really need to kind of dig into and have an informal discussion about. And so it was set up as a separate kind of interaction. So it's really in the framing um, of how the CEO presented this, that you know, we have our board meetings where it's very professional, it's very organized, and separately, we have this interaction that's much more flowing. But it's still with the, the same members of the board, like all the board members for that second week. It's just like a different time that they set aside to do this? So it could be either way. You could say, I'm gonna take a subset of the board, um, which is an even stronger signal that this is a different kind of interaction. So you could say, all right, we're having an issue with our next fundraise, so I'm gonna take the board members that 
really have a lot of experience with fundraising, and we're going to, you know, pull them into a separate meeting, which would make it even more clear that you're separating the two. Thank you. And then, <clears throat> for example, if you decide, okay, so, for example, I am the CEO, I present the case, uh, we have this problem, I think that the best way for us to go is this, 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 this. So, and then, but I know that in reality, I need to have more discussion to really dig it up and find you. Yes. Okay, but, okay, and then you do the subsidying of with other people. How do you come to the conclusion? So you have to call another uh, meeting with the, again, with the, for example, then you have option A, and after all this, you say, no, 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 option B is the best. So then how do you do? You call another session with everybody together? So you're saying you have a meeting where you present option A, there's pushback, so you say, all right, we're gonna have a separate meeting to brainstorm. And then, as you said, and then uh, after the brainstorm, it's like, okay. then with the other particular words, they can come out that uh, A is good, but it's better B because then you didn't realize all this view. Yeah. So yeah. how do you... So that's that? where it gets into um, the kind of very delicate um, people issues where you have to make a little bit of a judgment call. So there's a couple ways you could go. One is um, that you, you come to agreement with those people that are in the brainstorm, you kind of come up with a, a, a document that describes this is what we decided. You circulate that to the rest of the board and say, hey, we had a really robust discussion about this. I appreciate the input from you know, board members X, Y, Z. And this is what we have come up with. I feel like this is you know, a really strong direction. And um, let me know if you have any thoughts. And you sort of you know, send it out um, as a bit of a fait uh, accompli. Like uh, open ended, kind of. Yeah, well, I would say maybe not so open ended, maybe sort of say, look, this is what we coalesced upon. Um, and if the other board members feel like, well, those were, you know, the, the folks that really have a lot of expertise about financing met and discussed this, and this is what they came up with, okay. Um, the other way to do it would be to come back in the next board meeting and report out and say, you know, we had this discussion and this is what we decided and, you know, do the sort of the thumbs up, thumbs down in that setting. It depends partially on how close are you to running out of money because if your next board meeting isn't for a couple months and you need to raise money now, then, you know, you might sort of go with the, the email or the one-on-one -on -one quick phone calls. Hey, this is what we came up with out of that brainstorm. You know, does it sound good to you? Okay. There's <coughs> a difference, I think, between dynamics of committees and the interactions that you have with one or maybe two people. Uh, Mark Twain once said that a camel is a horse designed by committee. <laughs> <laughs> watch the, the video and see, um, do you think they're going to come up with the camera from the discussion in, in that meeting? Um, so thank you for the questions. I mean, if you have any others. Um, okay, so um, I think this discussion is actually a nice segue into the fourth tactic, which is once you have gathered a whole bunch of ideas, you've had these open-ended discussions, you've done your best to get everyone on board, try to build consensus, to really close the issue, sometimes you have to get political. And the CEOs that were the most effective understood this. And if they knew they had one or two people who might be still on the fence, they would really think about, how do I set this up in such a way that it's going to be very difficult for them to say no? So they leveraged the relationships that they had with people that supported the plan 
And this could include, you know, the board members that were already signed on. Um, it could also include consultants and even some very strategic use of media coverage. So if you are not 100% sure that one of your board members is in favor of a strategy, <coughs> you put out a press release to a friendly media outlet that you think is going to give you really positive reaction, and then that board member, oh, well, you know, I, I see this has already, we've already gotten um, positive response to this. Um, and you also use data. So use the data that support your chosen direction. So one CEO kind of explained how he developed from being more of a, um, I'm just going to present numbers and let you interpret them, to I'm going to tell a story with numbers. So before the word presentations were, here are the numbers, and now the word presentations are, here's the story of what's going on. The less effective CEOs um, either never used political action um, or they overused it. So you know, the, the danger, of course, with using this kind of leverage is that maybe you're, one, not getting to the right answer because you are kind of shutting down some discussion, or you're potentially alienating people who are like, well, you went and announced this to the press before I had fully agreed. Um, so this is not the full solution. It's something to do at the right time, um, just when you're trying to kind of close off an issue that's already had a lot of air and input. So the final finding of the study has to do with this sequencing of the different steps. And so they have this model where, for a particular strategic decision, you launch the process, and then you go through these different tactics until you close the process. And some of these tactics you do mostly throughout. So the dyadic interactions, developing those individual relationships with each board member that reflects their unique interests and expertise, that is going on throughout. Presenting with a single formal alternative um, is happening more in the middle. It doesn't make sense to do that at the very beginning before you really hear some different options and, and thought it through fully. And then the strategic brainstorming also happens mostly in the middle when you're still trying to kind of generate the best possible solution, which you would then take back to you know, a single formal alternative. The political piece comes at the very end. Once you have already gotten input, collected data, heard different opinions, vetted your ideas thoroughly, and you're just trying to get that closure because a decision is better than no decision, right? So that's a, kind of the small piece that comes at the very end. 